first question is, does God influence your lawmaking? Oh, sure. And, uh, my faith is very foundational to, to who I am. And so uh, since it's the foundational core of my beliefs, anytime you're looking at legislation, anytime you're looking at anything, I think it'd be hard not to filter that uh, through uh, your guiding belief system. And so uh, my belief in God and my faith definitely plays uh, an important role in, in the job I do as a legislator. Are there any issues or bills that you've taken a position on that stand out as far as where you have turned to your faith for the answer? Well, I, I think there's a lot of issues that comport with what I believe or, or some principles that I believe are found in Scripture. I guess probably the most obvious one is the pro-life issue. You know, when, when you read the, the psalm, when you read the Old Testament, it said, I knitted you together in your mother's womb before a day was there. I, I knew who you were. Um, and you see a lot of the importance that, that Scripture places on that, that unborn child is already a creation of God. I think that does give you uh, some extra motivation to want to protect those that you've seen in Scripture are deemed children of, of God. What do you say to people who, um, obviously, you know, 150-member body, uh, the different faiths practiced within that body, what do you say to somebody who's reached a different conclusion on an issue based on their definition of God? Yeah, well, you know, I, I would hope that we're always dealing with people who are sincere and genuine in, in their uh, belief system and, and what they're arguing. And if somebody is genuine and sincere and they b believe something or believe their principles lead them to some position, it's hard for me to argue with that. I mean, we still may disagree at the end of the day, but if you genuine, genuinely believe that that's the right thing, then, then I won't fault you for that. We'll just uh, agree to disagree. When it comes to um, issues like guns, we've heard the mention of God a lot. How do the two go in hand in hand for people, you know, watching the feed or who aren't kind of in the inside crowd? Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I hear people talk about that a lot. How's the uh, right to carry an AR-15 a God-given right? And I don't think that's as much the principle as the right to self-defense. And I think it all stems back to the founding of our country. And, and really one of the foundational principles that this country was founded upon is that government doesn't give us our rights. God does. Government exists to recognize and protect those rights. And so I think one of the foundations uh, beliefs that we saw was, uh, especially from a tyrant king in England, is that you have to have the right to protect yourself against a tyrant or a government that might seek to oppress you. And the way that that takes the form is the right to keep and bear arms. And so anytime you're seeking to infringe that or take that away from the people, then you are seeking to take away a God-given right to protect yourself. And so it may not be that you have the right to have this many uh, uh, rounds in your magazine or this kind of certain ammunition or this kind of firearm, but it goes back to that principle that you do have a right to defend yourself. That right is not given to you by the government. It's given to you by God, and it should be protected by the government, not infringed upon. How does your faith factor into the issue of capital punishment? Yeah, that's uh, and that's a great question. You know, there's uh, there's a lot of differing views out there. And so I, I'm a Christian who believes that capital punishment uh, is a legitimate use of the state. It should be used in only the rarest of circumstances. And when we are uh, accurate, most certain that we're accurate in what we're doing, but I think it's a legitimate tool of the state. I also have some Christian friends, uh, even in the legislature and others, uh, who think the exact opposite. But I feel like uh, if, if you want to use scripture, Romans 13 says the state does not bear the sword for nothing. And so we've seen that time and time again, that there are harsh punishments and there are harsh penalties for those who would perpetrate, uh, perpetrate heinous actions against other individuals in society. So I, I think you look at the whole of what you're uh, uh, faith believes it at what scripture says and you take that into account but even with that we have differing views and, and I don't think necessarily the other people are wrong I'm not going to say that I'm uh, agreed to be 100% right but I, I feel like that capital punishment is a legitimate tool for the state to employ and I don't see that as a contradiction with my faith with watching the feed again outsiders and they hear the mention of God or hear the mention of different members faith and they think, hey, what about church or separation of church and state? What would you say to that as far as how much, you know, with the invocation and, and things like that? Sure. And, you know, again, I think it goes back to you look at what our, our country was founded upon. E even Thomas Jefferson, Mr. Separation of Church and State, that that term came into, was coined in a letter that he wrote to a group of Baptists in, in 1802 in Danbury, Connecticut, was saying, hey, you, they were getting kind of worried that the church was uh, being taken over by the state. And uh, Thomas Jefferson was like, hey, don't, you don't have to worry about that. 
that. In America, we have a wall of separation of church and state, which meant that the church was never going to take over the state as it had done in England. It never meant that the church wasn't supposed to be involved or religion wasn't supposed to be involved in what the state was doing. Now, we never want uh, to have a state religion, but that doesn't mean that uh, the faith of the people who were in the legislative halls, the faith of our founding fathers should never come into play. I don't see how you can exclude that when so many people claim to have uh, either a Christian faith or some kind of faith system. I don't know how you keep that out. So unfortunately, I think we've distorted that uh, doctrine of separation of church and state to say you can't have any commingling between the two. Uh, we shouldn't have uh, religion in the state, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have any part or discussion of God in government. And with uh, religious freedom and same-sex marriage, um, just the definition between, you know, is one man, one woman, stick with that basically based on our foundation? Yeah, well, I, I think there's a, a lot of arguments not to redefine the uh, traditional definition of marriage. And some of them are religious, some of them are not religious. So um, I think sometimes people want to point to an issue and say, oh, they only want to do that for religious reasons. And sometimes even the pro-life issue or uh, the stem cell issue, I, I've heard a lot of people say, you just do that because you believe uh, you're a Christian. Well, not necessarily. I think there's good secular arguments, so to speak, for uh, a lot of those other issues as well. And I think the, the redefinition of marriage is the same way. There's certain strong biblical principles that I think that advocate for keeping marriage the definition between one man and one woman, but there's a lot of other reasons as well that are that are very compelling that it's not just a religious issue. Representative, thank you so much. We hit yeah. on a lot. And oh, good. You're